Thank you for joining me for another one of my videos. My name is Cliff. I've been doing a series called 99 Problems, but my God ain't one. And in this series, I've been speaking out about what's going on in the world, mainly um, why we as humans are having so many problems. I count down from the 99th issue all the way up to the number one reason why uh, the world and humans are having a battle against each other. The number one issue is our relationship with God. 99th uh, topic I sent is confusion. This is the number one uh, problem in the world. We're, we're meant to be confused. I'm going to call this number 66 and I'm going to label it the Mafia. Uh, most of my videos, uh, the titles don't really reflect completely the, the whole scope of what the topics is, is about. I, I did this because, first of all, there's 99 topics at least. I'm going to make 99 topics. And they all really interlink with one another. It's, I'm talking about the whole world and the deception of of humans and the confusion that we're in against the one truth is Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and without him you're not going to make it to where you came from you're not going to make it home um, this topic I call mafia the mafia back in the day when I was young um, the term or the name the mafia uh, came out I would say in the early 70s, I was just a young chap, uh, less than 10, and I would hear this term, or we would hear this term, the Mafia, and how this illegal organization um, works in the world. And back then, the question was, uh, is the Mafia real? Uh, nobody believed that the Mafia were, was real and an evil um, organization that uh, makes money by uh, devious means. And, and it was like a hidden organization. And, and back then, uh, I guess the the nature of the world or the nature of man was more more on a general good nature we wanted to believe that everybody is good and and even to this day we believe that uh, nearly everybody is good but it's completely opposite uh, nearly everyone is bad and mostly really bad uh, but the topic was m the mafia being real or not and later on uh, the mafia was definitely as we know has been exposed as a true organization uh, mainly Italian but uh, this is the day and age where we have another question that has arisen and it's called the organization is called the Illuminati and the question is the same as before is the Illuminati real and what I've learned in uh, a few years ago that this organization is real and it's it's the I would say the great grandparent or great great grandparent to the mafia the mafia is run by the Illuminati so this this program or sorry this video mainly is about the Illuminati not the mafia number 66 I use the number also to um, designate the, the importance of what I'm talking about, the Illuminati, the 
the demonic state that is is so I use the reference of the number 66 the number 6 is um, known to be if you learn um, how the enemy the one the evil one uses um, numerology the, the number 6 is demonic as well or evil or his number um, look around or hear what's going on in the world you'll see many things uh, making reference to the number six um, but that's another topic altogether is the Illuminati real let me show you the Federal Reserve is, the chairman of the Federal Reserve is on something called the National Advisory Council on International Monetary and Financial Policies. That's supposed to be the oversight agency. The Treasury Secretary chairs that group. The chairman of the SEC is on it. The chairman of the uh, Export-Import Bank, all of the, the Commerce Department, all of the economic agencies of the U.S. government are supposed to be monitoring the World Bank because it has $180 billion worth of bonds on the capital markets. There is a corrupt group that has actually been called out by the uh, foremost university in Europe called the Federal Institute of Technology located in Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, three mathematicians modeled who owned the capital markets and they found out that there was something they call the super entity which is pulling down 60% of the annual earnings of the 43,000 transnational companies. And the uh, 10 banks that everybody thinks are separate, like Goldman Sachs or uh, Bank of America or Citibank, they all have the same directors on their boards. They're really, for practical purposes, one big conglomerate. And that group has been uh, thinking that it's above the law, and it's not. So what you're saying is that there's, there, there's a, there's a supranational banking institution that has board members shared on multiple corporations, so they're basically intermarried banking institutions? That's right. That's how we got the LIBOR scandal. That's how we have manipulation of gold prices and a lot of other uh, nefarious goings on. And anybody in the government that tries to stand up to them, like JFK, for example, gets assassinated. That's what happened to Lincoln, the predecessor uh, group. And when our founding fathers set up their uh, constitution, they knew about this group because there's actually a group behind that group. That's called the Jesuits. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, 
on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. Tell us what exactly you witnessed, what corruption you witnessed while working at the World Bank in your, in your 20 years there. Okay, I didn't know anything actually about what I'm telling now. Um, I was fired illegally in 2007 because I was just doing the job of a lawyer who's working for a company that has bonds outstanding on the capital markets, which is the financial statements have to be accurate, and they were not. Anybody who reported um, poor accounting practices got fired without any recourse because the World Bank is an international organization and you cannot sue it in court unless you're a bondholder. So no. what this sneaky group did was they took the same directors and put them on the boards of all the companies. That's called interlocking directors. And so this group has grabbed secret control of the 40% um, of the net worth of all of the companies traded on the capital markets and 60% of their annual earnings. I, after I was fired, I found out that one of the main functions of the World Bank and the IMF, you know, these two organizations are really, for all practical purposes, just one organization. Right. They're across the street from each other, and there's a board of governors, which is the ministers of finance of all the member countries. And those ministers of finance gather together um, twice a year, plus there's um, a group of 25 ministers of finance that meet and consult with each other on an ongoing basis. And so um, the answer is that, yes, there was always a secret hidden agenda, but at the same time, it is a convening party. And it is um, a, a structure that the people of, of uh, the earth who want to clean up this corruption in the financial system, and it is a matter of whether or not we're going to continue with Western civilization. We're on the edge. Because when I started out, I, didn't, I, just, I was just doing what a lawyer inside an entity that issues bonds on the capital markets, because that's what the World Bank does. It issues $180 billion worth of bonds all over the place, denominated in all the currencies of the world. It takes the money from the people who buy those bonds, and it trades on the, on the capital markets, earns money. That's how the World Bank finances its budget. So I was trying to correct the financial information. That was my job as a lawyer inside the World Bank legal department. Most people think that the UN is our last best hope for peace. That's the way it was uh, sold to me when I was in school. Uh, it was uh, offered as an organization uh, where different nations could come together and work out their problems and their grievances in a peaceful manner and um, be a means of uh, reducing world conflict and increasing the economic prosperity of all of the member nations and all of these wonderful things. In reality, it turns out to be none of the above. In reality, the United Nations is a, a the seat of what the member governments hope will become a true world government. It's to be a government. And there's nothing inherently wrong with a world government, but we need to ask the question, what kind of a world government is this going to be? If the United Nations were going to be a government based on all of the things they've said it was going to be, peace and prosperity and protecting individual rights and all of these things, I think it'd be pretty hard to oppose it. But in reality, it's being built as a model of collectivism. The political ideology that is inherent in the United Nations is collectivism. 
It's a word that probably needs to be defined for our purposes here. But in general, it means a totalitarian system, a system of uh, concentration at the top and the people being at the bottom being ruled from above, not that the people have any voice in determining the direction of their government or the world, but they are to be told what the direction is, and they're to be told to follow it. Collectivism is a philosophy of big government and small people, and it's a philosophy that supposedly uh, all of this is being done in the name of society. In other words, it's for the greater good of the greater number, supposedly. And so you're supposed to go along with whatever inconvenience or uh, insult to your freedom comes along, because after all, it's in the greater good uh, of the greater number. And this is the, the rationale being used, has been used for quite some time, to justify all kinds of horrible atrocities. All the leaders have to do is say, well, it's for the greater good of the greater number. That's the philosophy that's built into the United Nations from top to bottom. And so therefore, the answer to the question, what is the United Nations? The United Nations is a budding or building world totalitarian system. I know I seem like the bad guy in all this, but in the interest of preserving our freedom, there are larger issues at play. What about my freedom? With freedom comes responsibility. I have rights. This isn't about you. This is about eight million other people. If I do what you want, it'll keep me in this chair. There is a nuclear bomb somewhere in Los Angeles. And every television station in the world will broadcast the precise details of its detonation. So go on, push that two minutes as far as you can, and find it. Uh, the United States has always been the major supporter and financer of the United Nations. So you'd have to say that the key people behind the United Nations are the globalists, I think is the best word to use to describe them, in the United States. Now who are they? They would be politicians, they would be people in the State Department, and they would be international financiers. You must remember, for example, that the, the land uh, where the United Nations is uh, seated was purchased by the Rockefellers and donated to uh, the United Nations. Well, they didn't do that as a, as a means of uh, uh, being great humanitarians, although that's the image that many people have. Something those morning injections take away. I thought the injections are for our health. No, they remove something. What? Emotions. You mean like feelings? Feelings are just fleeting on the surface. But emotions, they're very deep, primal, they linger. They're Jonas. You might not understand where you are or what's happening, but don't think about what you're seeing. Listen. Listen to what's calling from inside. They did because they had a keen interest in building this new world order and they thought this would be the seat for it and so that's why they did that. So the people behind it in the United States are the international financiers who are located here, the primarily the Rockefeller group and what's left to the old J.P. Morgan group and some of the larger banks. But primarily um, you find most of these people in an organization uh, that is uh, not well known but definitely very important. It's called the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a group in the United States with about 4,000 members at the most. And yet these people, number one, are all dedicated to building a new world order, a global government, based on the model of collectivism. And number two, you find them at the tops of most of the important organizations in this country. You find them in government. We hear a lot of people talk about they. Who are they? In my opinion, the Bilderberg Group. The Illuminati. Bohemian Grove. The Council on Foreign Relations. Father Burke. Carlisle. The Military Industrial Complex. Rockefeller. Rockefeller. WTO. CIA. NSA. MIC. CIA. 
about half of our presidents and vice presidents and uh, just about all of our secretaries of state and secretaries of defense and heads of the CIA and the FBI and all of the important positions in government. If you look at who these people are over the years, they're members of this Council on Foreign Relations. Most of the great universities they have as their president or the board of directors dominated members of the Council on Foreign Relations. The news channels, ABC, CBS, NBC, the Turner Broadcasting System, uh, Murdoch. I mean, Murdoch is a well-known member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So all of these major power centers of society are in the hands of this small group, under 4,000 members. And so you ask who's behind it. If you want a list, that's a good place to start. Uh, write to the Council on Foreign Relations office in uh, New York, as I have done every year, and I ask for a membership report or an annual report. And on the back of each report, they proudly list all of their members. So that's where you find who is behind the United Nations. That's the, that's the genius of these rulers, that they've, they've created this society that's conditioned to deny what's right in front of its eyes. Which is what? That we're slaves. That's a hard word for many people to accept, or, or a phrase, to accept that we have an internationalist elite. A lot of people believe that, you know, in this country, we're the uh, masters of our own political destiny. We don't have an elite. Maybe we have some rich people. Yes, we have some powerful people. But the idea of an elite, or an international elite, elite is foreign to the thinking of a lot of Americans. But the truth is, we do have one. And their intention is to, number one, maintain their positions of uh, being the elite, having uh, vast power and control and financial wealth, and number two, to extend it to the international level. Uh, we have these international elites, we call them international, but basically they're housed in each nation. We have them in England and France and the United States and Germany and so forth. And now the big move among these people is to coalesce into a true international elite whereby uh, they will be operating through the the governmental power of the United Nations. Now uh, they, uh, they really have clout because there's no nation in the world that can escape their power because the, the way these people work is that they, if they want to accomplish something, if they have an agenda, uh, let's just pick one at, uh, at random, a disarmament or another one, uh, population control or something like that, uh, as it is now they have to convince each of the respective nations and their governments to implement those agendas. But once you have a true United Nations with a true governmental power, with uh, real military forces, and once you have uh, turned over to these, uh, uh, these agencies of international power control over your armies and over your air force and over your weapons of mass destruction, you have created a global government which is, uh, cannot be challenged by any nation whatsoever. So now these international elites do not have to worry about uh, convincing the governments in each uh, part of the world, as long as they control the center of this power, which is the United Nations, they therefore can control the world. It's a very heady wine, I'm sure, and, but that's what their objective is. But uh, the obligation of the United States to the United Nations on a legal front uh, has become entwined in these things we call treaties. So if you're talking as a globalist, uh, or as an internationalist and you want to see the building of this new world order, you would say that our obligation to the United Nations is legal and it's binding because the United Nations has the status of a treaty. And then we have all these sub-treaties that follow along after it, NAFTA and GATA, GATA and all of these organizations that are created, those are all based on treaty agreements. And so piece by piece, they've been weaving this fabric around us like the little, so, uh, the little silk threads uh, that the Lilliputians wrapped around, uh, who was uh, Gulliver, <laughs> Gulliver's travels. I mean, any one thread you could break, but Gulliver woke up one morning and he had these thousands of little threads around his body. And although he was a giant compared to them, he could not move, they had captured him. So I think that's basically what's going on. And in that sense, we have this obligation to the United Nations because we're being bound down by thousands of treaties and uh, it's destroying our independence. And Arthur's body in his arms, 
stand in front of the microphones and begin to speak. Watch how long she says some of this stuff Speech has been is planned way. right here. But it's the most rousing speech I've ever read. It's been worked on here and in Russia on and off for over eight years. Eight years. I shall force someone to take the body away from him. Then Johnny will really hit those microphones and those cameras with blood all over him. Fighting off anyone who tries to help him. Defending America even if it means his own death. Rallying a nation of television viewers into hysteria to sweep us up into the White House with powers that will make martial law seem like anarchy. Martial law. Now this is very important. Martial law. I want the nominee to be dead about two minutes after he begins his acceptance speech, depending on his waiting time under pressure. You are to hit him right at the point that he finishes the phrase, nor would I ask of any fellow American in defense of his freedom that which I would not gladly give myself. My life before my liberty. Is that absolutely clear? Would you repeat it for me, Rem? Nor would I ask of any fellow American in defense of his freedom. In defense of his freedom. That which I would not gladly give. Give myself. Myself. My life uh, before my liberty. Before my liberty. I know you will never entirely comprehend this, Raymond. But you must believe I did not know it would be you. I served them. I fought for them. I'm on the point of winning for them the greatest foothold they will ever have in this country. And they paid me back by taking your soul away from you. I told them to build me an assassin. I wanted a killer from a world filled with killers, and they chose you. Because they thought it would bind me closer to them. But now we have come almost to the end. One last step. And then when I take power, they will be pulled down and grounding to death for what they did to you. And what they did in so good. Contemptuously underestimating me. Mr. President, we have a 51% identity match on Majid al -Kawi. The bad news is, there's some possibility he's at a funeral. You should also be aware we have an abort recommendation but the Joint Chiefs are urging a go. All right, what's your recommendation? Sir, we measure success by the least amount of collateral damage. At 51% probability, the risk is too high. And if it is Al Koei and he walks, I'm putting our people at risk. You have a go. Thank you, Mr. President. We're weapons hot. We have weapons Low key. hot. Repeat. You are clear to engage. CID. We have handshake with the MQ-9 Reaper. Sending you images now. Low key target coordinates received. Yes, sir. Switching to IR sensor. Target is legs. Master arm on. Misses away. Ten seconds to impact. 